Hey, what's going on, everyone? Uh, hope your week's uh, finishing up strong. Um, I wanted to make a video here. I'm kind of calling it USPS drama or USPS stole my knife. Um, something that we see quite often in the, the forums and groups that I belong to. Um, I apologize, my notes page kind of looks like a beautiful mind here. So if I glance down at it, that's what I'm doing. Um, but just kind of wanted to cover some of my background experience with USPS and then go over some of the feedback I've gotten from actual postal workers and then some, some best practices for um, buying and selling and more importantly, shipping knives on the secondary market. So as far as my background or experience goes with USPS, I would say over the last like six months, I've definitely, you know, kind of gotten really into the secondary knife game, both buying and selling. And, and I've certainly learned a lot, but kind of within the span of like two weeks, there were just a lot of examples, whether it was myself or someone that I had interacted with that had some sort of issue with USPS. I won't go into them, you know, in great depth or great length but you know it certainly got me thinking i was like man like is my number about to be up like i, I think it's very easy for people to complain and like bitch or post about things when they happen when it happens to you right like that's when you actually care about things and um but i kind of wanted to get ahead of it did some research thought i could pass it on to all of you of like you know what are some best practices and what actually goes into, you know, USPS, the insurance, for instance, PayPal, et cetera. So we're going to cover some of that. And I think the main impetus for me doing this is when I first started, I mean, like I was sending in the mail, you know, $180, $200 Spydercos. And I kind of went from that to, you know, selling $700 McNeese, whereas like the Spyderco, like, if it got lost or stolen and routed, like, all right, here's your money back kind of thing. But when you get into those like higher end knives, like that's a really hard loss to take. And uh, kind of gets me into my next point of like buying and selling on the secondary market. Um, I can't stress it enough. And one of the epiphanies that I had was ensure that you're getting vouchers for, even if you're a seller, give vouchers for your buyer. Cause there's also some new scams that are going around where, you know, people will pay the 3% PayPal fee to do goods and services. And then they'll actually say that it was an unauthorized charge on their, on their credit card. So if something feels kind of weird. I would definitely go the goods and services route. Um, and you know, do the signature confirmation so that it's confirmed that it actually ended up where, uh, where you sent the knife. Um, the other point that I wanted to bring up was just the, kind of like where does the risk lie on the secondary market and I kind of I always thought like oh as a buyer which I mean certainly you do have more risk as a buyer sometimes because you know like if I get say I buy this Microtech SOCOM and I'm like yeah it's like new in box and then I get it it's scratched up it's you know there's rust all over it I at least have kind of like a recourse in the sense that I can post on these sites and that person that, you know, kind of misled me with the description, they'll get kicked out of the group and not be able to to do uh, business again. So there's kind of always like that's kind of a, a safety net in a way for you, um, you know, certainly buying stuff is that like you do have that recourse. But you know, certainly the the buyer's part in this transaction is just, all right, cool, looks good here's the money, ship it out, you know, give me tracking information when you have it, and then you sit tight and wait for your knife to arrive. It's much more, there's other parties involved as a seller of a knife. So I mean, taking into account that, you know, making sure obviously you have an accurate description of the knife that you're selling, but you know, going to the post office, you know, you packing, packing it up. I mean, you want to make sure you're doing a really good job with packing it up. Cause as we'll see here, um, you know, your packages, when you send them, they, they go through a lot of stuff. And, um, but you know, like should that package go missing? So after I'm paid for a knife, you paid me for this Microtech SOCOM. I'm like, cool, here you go. Go to the post office, send it out. If that knife never arrives there, I'm the one as the seller that's eating that cost, right? Like there's no, I'm relying on a third party, which is the USPS, you know, right from, you know, the all the sorting facilities to, you know, whether it's airmail, whether it's your carrier deliverer, deliver, um, I'm relying on a lot more people as a seller than, than the buyer is. So just, just kind of be aware of that. Like, certainly I think a lot of times we say like, oh, the burden of proof or like the burden for buying, selling or trading is on the buyer. Cause you're taking a risk. That's not necessarily true these days. So definitely be cognizant of that.
All right, moving right along. Um, if, if I'm honest with myself, I think my impetus behind, you know, making this video or, you know, certainly looking into the U.S. Postal Service was Brian Nadeau's post, which I'll post here again. Um, you know, like he's basically convinced that USPS was ripping off his packages, stealing the knives, whatever. He even tried to use his wife's name on the return address. He's convinced that they stole his packages. So you read that kind of at face value and you're like, wow, this is crazy. Certainly, I think he was just, you know, upset. I don't know any more details except for that Instagram post. But, you know, after kind of talking, doing research or whatever, the chances that United States postal workers rip your knife off is slim to numb. none. Again, you have to think about, you know, this is their job. It's a federal job. They have a pension. They don't want to lose it. There's also, I mean, they have people like supervisors inside sorting facilities that, will literally plant money on the ground to see if the workers will turn it in. There's two-way mirrors that kind of like line the facility so they never know when they're being watched. And also just the sheer volume, like the chances that they see your flat rate box, you know, that, oh, this is like a, looks like it's knife size. They have no clue or whatever. Like the chances that yours gets picked out of the thousands and thousands and thousands of packages is very slim. So the chances of a United States, you know, postal worker, a federal employee stealing your knife is, is very low. So if postal workers didn't steal your package and never got to where it was going, what happened? Um, the more common mistakes that I see, and again, based on research, I'm going to stop saying that because all this is, I'm not just spitballing here. Um, a lot of things when packages went missing were due to an incorrect address um, that was written. So again, you're kind of given that opportunity when you turn in a box to send, they'll kind of show you the address, you know, making sure that the address that you wrote on the box is matching what you see on the screen. That's, that's definitely a huge one. Um, you know, we also have, see things get stolen at the destination. So, you know, you see ring cam footage all the time of people going around ripping off boxes that are on people's porches. That's definitely a big thing. Um, another thing can be labels either ripped off or getting covered up so they can't actually scan the barcode. That's another thing. But when that happens, what I've learned is if, you know, a package is unscannable, it kind of gets put off to the side and um, they'll do a more manual version of sorting it. So, I mean, ideally everything's done by computers, spitting things through machines. When that doesn't work, it kind of goes into a separate pile and, and they handle it from there. Um, the last thing why your package went missing is shitty packing jobs. And and I, I can't stress it enough because um, I do like I buy knives or trade knives all the time. And there's just such a vast like we need to have a standard for shipping knives of like what is acceptable because some people like, I don't know if like where they come from tape is like the scarce, whatever, but packing tape is cheap. Bubble wrap is cheap. Like pack the ever living shit out of your boxes, tape them, make it so that, you know, nothing can happen to them. And kind of like, you know, like if, if you don't do that, you definitely run the risk or at least increase your risk of that package not getting to its destination. And I'll post a picture right here because I want you to remember this. When you're packing up a knife or whatever, these are the, the machines that it goes through and it's multiple machines, multiple drops, multiple sorting things. Like this package is getting thrown around. I think sometimes we're kind of misled and thinking like, oh, like, you know, I turned this box over to the post office. Oh, like, thank you. I'm going to put it in this cart and then it goes and then the carrier takes it, whatever. No, these are getting thrown through multiple, multiple industrial sorting machines. So pack your shit. All right. The next thing I wanted to talk about, which I've heard kind of things all over the place with it, but insurance. So if you are shipping a knife or an object, we'll, we'll stick with knives for the purposes of this video, but should you insure your package on the secondary market? Probably not. Um, USPS has well-established guidelines for establishing proof of value, which I'll post right here. And kind of the, the ones of a lot of times buying in the secondary market, unless you were the original purchaser. So like, say you bought a knife from DLT trading, you don't like it, you're going to sell it, whatever. That proof of value can be established based on your receipt with your name on it, with the item and the price that you paid. That that's definitely like I think that that would be a righteous endeavor to pursue some sort of insurance claim should it go missing. Where that kind of differs is the last bullet there, which I'll post the video or the picture again. If you're buying through some sort of like third party, like you know Venmo, Cash App, Apple Pay, PayPal, whatever, 
you have to have an itemized description of that item and what you paid. But, you know, similar to like a moving company, right? Like, I mean, they take into account depreciation. So, you know, the USPS is not going to pay your hype prices for things. So like, you know, that super rare CRK, you know, BG42 that you just sold for $2,800, like, if you send that and take out $2,300 worth of insurance, be ready if that goes missing to get, you know, whatever the MSRP was like 300 bucks. Like, I don't know. Um, kind of to further make this even more ambiguous is the fact that, you know, on the secondary market from what I've seen and experienced, if you're using PayPal, people want to use friends and family. And oh, by the way, PayPal will you know, freeze your account. If there's any sort of talk of a weapon, knife, gun part, whatever, like they will freeze your account. So usually what people do is they'll say, hey, like pay friends and family or add 3%, don't put any notes in there. Without those notes, you cannot establish what that transaction was for. So you can insure it for, you know, say I sell an $1,100 Shira Goroff, I can, you know, be like no notes, 1100 bucks, whatever. If that Shiro goes missing, I will have no record of that. I have a credit card statement, but it needs to be itemized and it needs to have like, I mean, if you can go so far as to put a serial number down, something like that, that, that would definitely help you out. But all in all, like, I mean, buy selling and trading on the secondary market, like as a seller, if you, if you send something, there is a, you know, proof of value guidelines um, provided by USPS. So definitely get smart on those because you're probably not covered and you are most likely wasting your time uh, with insurance. Another best practice that I was made aware of, which I don't know, to be honest with you, I'm not too stoked about it because it's expensive. But what I the feedback I received from an actual postal worker was using um, Priority Express and I'll post a picture right here. So if you ship using this service, so again, it starts at $27. So maybe just, you know, relegate this one for the more expensive items. But, you know, you're certainly able to get, you know, signature confirmation, the, the tracking's really good. But more importantly, when you ship that Priority Express, it, it goes through a different sorting process. And there's a less likely of a chance that this will go missing. So again, it's $27. That kind of hurts. It would be expensive to send a knife, but if you want to kind of, you know, stack the odds in your favor, that Priority Express, from what I can tell, is is the best way to go. And then to sum this video up, um, it should it should just be noted that at the end of the day, I mean, USPS is a company just like anyone else. Annually, they report anywhere from a 1.5 to 3 percent loss. And so when I think about how many knives I've sold or bought, you know, I'm like, man, I'm kind of right on the precipice there. Like it, my, my number's probably almost up. And I just hope that when it does happen, it's $150 Spidey and not a, you know, thousand dollar Shiro. Um, I think like I'm kind of in a unique position. And like I said, at the beginning of this video, like a lot of people like to bitch and complain about stuff, like after it happens to them, this has not happened to me yet, but it's certainly the lessons that I learned from actually investigating this or trying to get more information just because I, I didn't know what was what. Um, I think I'm able to make like better decisions now, like certainly that Priority Express if I'm selling something or sending something that's, you know, very valuable going that route. And then also I just I can't stress it enough. Like, I mean, the way you pack something will will really affect like you know how it does in all those machines like again please think of that picture i posted of that sorting facility because honestly that had a huge impact on me and um you know i i spoke about it in my last video that i made but certainly when i'm selling things now like i'll take that small flat rate and um you know if if the knife has a, a box i'll either put it in a plastic bag or wrap it in printer paper and then i leave the the flat rate small box flat on the table i'll tape it down to it put the box so actually build the box around it and then i i literally take just like you know heavy duty packing tape and i just wrap the whole thing again like if it takes somebody at the other end a couple more seconds to open it so be it they'll be happy they actually got their knife and i'll be happy that i'm not out eleven hundred dollars um <laughs> because something went missing so i hope that this video was was useful i mean certainly it's kind of a dry topic but it, it was something that i couldn't really find 
any great details or guidance in one central location. So I hope that that kind of, uh, you know, this provides that for, for you all. Um, have a couple more knife reviews coming up this weekend, trying to uh, take advantage of a, a lower key weekend. So we'll see what we can do. Um, I probably want to be reviewing this Microtech SOCOM Bravo that I just traded for. Pretty excited about this one. Um, I also have uh, that Koenig Arius that I got. I just, I need to get some more stick time with it, but that's definitely on my hit list. And then I actually want to kind of go back and um, had kind of a funny conversation with uh, one of the guys on one of the Facebook groups, but I still haven't reviewed uh, Spyderco PM2. And, and I think that it's, it's one of those knives that there's a lot to say about, and it certainly is, it's, it's kind of like a gateway drug to more expensive knives. And so I kind of want to talk about that a little bit. So more to come, appreciate you all tuning in and we will see you next time.